everyone. All right. If you guys, I know there's a lot of D2C brands out there, and we all know that the pandemic, this, this, is, this is the pan pandemic we said, only online shopping, right? We were all going to only online shop shopping, no brick and mortar. Well, funny thing is happening. There's a comeback. How to win and come back from, uh, from to, to brick and mortar. And so I'd love to introduce Sidura from Klarna um, and Aaron from Mace Rich. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and just what you, I mean, you're doing so many things. You've been at Klarna for how long? For two years. Um, thank you, Megan, for the intro. First of all, thank you for having us back here again this year. It is so nice to be back in person and not doing this virtually, so very, very excited. Um, as Megan mentioned, I'm Sundara. I'm leading in-store growth at Klarna globally. For those of you that aren't familiar with Klarna, we are a payment solution for buy now, pay later, a shopping app, and a marketing platform all in one. We have about 150 million customers globally, and we work with around 450,000 brands. On a daily basis, we transact 2 million transactions. So as you can imagine, just given the sheer number of transactions that we have, we have really amazing purchase data, and we'll be sharing some of that with you today. Prior to Klarna, I was at Walmart e-commerce as a GM there, and before that, I was head of beauty at Jet.com which was a company that was acquired by Walmart. And in that time, I had the privilege of working with so many indie brands and had the privilege of working and getting to know so many founders. So the space is really near and dear to my heart. And I actually, Megan knows this, was a founder myself before that. Um, I had a direct-to-consumer brand that we successfully transitioned to being an omni-channel brand and had retail distribution in about six countries. So you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of pros and cons to doing this. So we'll get into some of that and then feel free to reach out to me afterwards and we can certainly talk through anything that you want to. We'll pass it to Erin. Hi, I'm Erin Bryan. I'm the Senior Manager of Business Development for Mace Rich. We own and operate 45 shopping centers across the country. We also own some mixed use development too, so hotels and um, residential. Before Mace Rich, I've been at four, four years at Mace Rich. I was at Westfield for seven years and I was at Caruso Affiliated for five. So I'm on my third mall developer and I never pictured myself being a mall rat my whole career, but here I am. Um, and actually absolutely passionate about this space and excited to talk to you all about it. And I've partnered um, with Cindura from Klarna, who is really the most perfect partner and we'll get into that as well. We have the retail experts, as you can tell. So there's no, and again, if you, if you have questions, we'll probably do a you know, five minute Q&A at the end. Um, so we all thought that D2C was going nowhere. It was going to just go straight up in the air post during pandemic. And then now you're seeing, you guys are seeing so much data. Um, and I just want to hear, what, do you, what are you seeing in terms of going from, you know, D to C to brick and mortar? Because you guys are seeing some incredible changes in consumer behavior from your end. Yeah, I can start first. So we, you know, Q2 of 2020, which I know is a time no one wants to relive, but this was right after the lockdowns. Um, year over year, e-commerce growth was 44%. And for some brands, they were seeing a doubling of their business or even the tripling of their business. And many people out there thought this was a permanent acceleration of e-commerce and really the final nail in the coffin for brick and mortar retail. Two years later, what we're actually seeing is a return to normalcy. And you'll see that if you listen to the earnings calls of a lot of retailers out there, if you look at the share prices of a lot of e-com companies out there, you're really seeing brick and mortar come back again. And today, brick and mortar retail, even after the worst thing that could have happened to it happened, is still 86% of retail sales. It is enormous, and the resilience of it has been clear in what we've seen over the past few years. Um, we get, uh, Klarna has a very young consumer, and we get asked often, who's coming back to stores? Are young people coming back to stores as well? We do a holiday survey every holiday season, and um, last year, our holiday survey said, our consumers said that 
38% of them were planning to do most of their shopping in stores. And then this year, that number is up to 68%. So it is an enormous increase, nearly a doubling of the number of people that plan to shop predominantly in stores this holiday. Yay. <laughs> Uh, it's no secret that prior to the pandemic, uh, e-commerce was really disrupting the industry. Um, and we already saw brands like BB, who I personally ran for almost exclusively in the 90s, um, shutter all their doors. And then um, the pandemic hit, and it really just accelerated the process of kind of weeding out those retailers that just kind of weren't doing it right, which really doing it right was having a strong e-commerce presence plus a brick and mortar presence. So flash forward, um, we as mall developers saw it as a huge opportunity to usher in these incredible e-commerce brands that wanted to open stores um, Hammett in the audience today, Tony, is one of those. He was exclusively online, and now he's opening stores, and he's in department stores, and he's absolutely thriving. So um, we love seeing that. We um, are welcoming that. Our big box retailers, like Sears, um, we got those spaces back, and we're not only redeveloping some of those into hotels and uh, residential, but if anyone's ever heard of like the retailer Shields, um, that is an, a great example of an experiential retail, which is not only has the retail component, but they have you know Ferris wheels inside their store and things for children to do and games, and it, it can be a whole day experience. Um, so shifting the retail landscape away from just traditional retail and bringing in those experiential uses, more restaurants, more spas, gyms, um, getting people to the mall more often, it's only translating into more sales. And it's true, I will acknowledge the elephant in the room, there are malls that are dying. South Bay, I live in Redondo Beach, it's a really good example. We have Delamo Mall, thriving. It's one of the largest per square foot malls in the country. Um, and then right down the street, the South Bay Galleria is most likely going to be torn down eventually. And did we need two mega malls next to each other? We really didn't. Um, so, you know, it's the bigger, fewer, better shopping centers um, that are catering to the consumer that are going to survive. And so how has uh, the pand pandemic changed in store shopping? Is there a real shift that you're seeing of, of how people are... I mean, I love your, you have insane data. So, especially from Klarna, where they pretty much can tell all the, all the, everything that's happening. I love that it's not only a payments platform, but also a data company. So just to talk, me about, talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with what Aaron is saying about fewer and better. We're seeing that with our retail partners as well. So even if they're closing stores, they're investing a lot in their store fleet and making the stores that they do have much better. Uh, there are really two things that come to mind when it comes to how in-store shopping has changed. One is that the store experience is more important than ever. So many people had to shop in e-commerce, so if they're making the effort to go into your store, you have to make it a worthwhile experience for them to spend there. There was a, a recent article from Forbes, and they did a study on stores where they just played music. That was the only thing they did and they saw a 17% increase in sales just from playing music, right? So it is just, it's a silly data point, but it just really drives home the fact that people want to have a good time. Like they want to go to your store, they want to stay, they want to have a great experience there, so make sure that you're doing that. The second piece is just the importance of omnichannel is so critical these days. Um, there was a, a dichotomy that happened during the last two years where there were retailers that were forced to take all of their resources and putting, put it into e-commerce and fix their e-com experience in order to survive. And there were retailers that had the privilege because they already had a solid e-com experience of investing that time that they had when stores were slow to really improve that experience. And those are the stores you see today that have Boris and Bopis and have RFIDs and have BNPL in their stores and have QR codes. And those are the stores that customers want to go back to because it is so much more convenient. 
for them to do that, and it's just a far better experience. And we're seeing that those retailers are, have set the bar so high that everyone else is being forced to really tech enable their stores and make them better. Yeah, it's all about catering to our consumers. Um, the days of retailers just doing them uh, and not thinking about the consumer experience are over. Now it's how does mom want to shop? What's convenient for her? Does she want to go online and then pick up in store? And if so, do we have a venue where the store uh, employee can just walk it out to a curbside scenario? Or does someone want to do the research online, shop in store, try things on, then go home and think about it, and then shop online? Um, what's really interesting is the e-commerce brands that are opening up brick and mortar stores, when they go back to their data, they will see an uptick in online sales in that geographic area where their brick and mortar store was open. So they work hand in hand and the brands that are thriving are the ones who are embracing both. It's like they need seven touch points, in person, experiential, the whole thing, the whole thing. And it's I, tough I, for the retailers. It's a lot of resources they have to expend. It's incredible. But so from that, because I think it's really interesting now in this day and age, not only are you guys seeing everything from the e-commerce lens of data, but how, and then you're seeing the data in store, but how are you merging that data and using, and, and how are brands using that to actually figure out how to target their customers, what's selling, what SKUs they should be producing. Um, just talk to me a little bit about how a brand would do that and, and, and you know, probably some resources that Klarna has, Mace Rich has that you know, if you're, you go from D to C to in-store, you know, what, what that is. Yeah, I can, so it's really about being tech-enabled, right? Which I believe is a competitive advantage today for retailers and everyone should be looking into how they can make their stores more tech forward. At Klarna, we have a few technologies that, that retailers enable. The first is our bread and butter, our buy now, pay later technology, which when merchants add that tech, we're seeing about 118% lift in AOV. That is a doubling of your basket size simply by adding a payment method. You don't often see results like that, and it's been really impressive. Um, we also have a virtual clienteling product that we have, which connects store associates to consumers that are shopping in e-commerce. So if you're a retailer that has a handful of stores, say two or three stores, and not all of your customers are around their stores, it's a great way to bridge that gap between e-commerce and retail where you can have your store associates show your consumers the products. You can have them have a conversation, ask for more information about the products. Um, we also have a digital receipts product, which is also fantastic in that it allows you to collect CRM data, basically your customer's email addresses, and you send them a digital receipt where um, they're able to see deals to come back to your store. So you're not having this transactional relationship with the customer when they're walking in and they're leaving um, and you don't have their email address, you're just handing them a paper receipt, you actually collect their email addresses. Beyond our products though, there's, there's so much else going on in the space. Uh, QRs, for example, are a fantastic, cheap, and easy way to bring tech to your stores. Um, a great application of this is Endless Isle. So if you have more products and you're featuring somewhere, you can use the QR code to send the consumer to a broader assortment. I actually did this in Walmart stores when I was at, over at Walmart and it was incredibly successful and we spent absolutely no money in us doing that. Um, you can also use it to do something like someone scans a QR code, you get a discount. In order to get the discount, you have to, again, give the merchant your email address. There was a speaker earlier who was speaking about how retargeting is so challenging these days because of change in rules and so much more expensive, which is true. So this just allows you to have the consumer give you their email address so you have the permission to reach them via your CRM channels. Um, then the last piece is, and I just love QR in this, you can tell. <laughs> Although I have seen stores do QR really, really poorly where they have 100 QR codes everywhere, so do not do that. But there are so many different applications. And then the last piece that you were getting to, Megan, is data. Um, also such interesting things happening in the space. There are platforms that 
basically scour social channels and search to look at emerging trends at a very hyper local level. So what that allows you to do is if you have a store, you can actually make buying decisions regionally. And it's not that expensive for you to get access to these databases and it allows you to be really thoughtful about what you're buying. There are also programs like Placer AI that have used device IDs to give you near real-time data on demographics and foot traffic, and you can use that data to figure out where your first store should be, or if you're doing a partnership, where that should be. So interesting. And what are you seeing? Um, well, she covered most of it. Um, but really, the brick and mortar and their e-commerce platforms, they have to talk to each other. So you have to be able to go online and see what the inventory is in store and vice versa. I really love um, Nordstrom Rack's model where every single store employee has a checkout iPad. No more waiting in line. In fact, at first it was like a hack. Like, don't you know you don't have to wait in line at the checkout? Just go ask anyone to check you out. But again back to the consumer experience, making it easier and using technology to do so. And in terms of these brands that are just D2C only and they're going, how do they actually, say they want to test brick and mortar in a, in a not in like the full on, I'm having my own store, I don't have enough money. What would be, I mean, what are good ways for them or any advice that you can give to people that have been strictly brick and, I mean, strictly D2C, but want to go into brick and mortar? Sure, yeah. Um, and this is another way that us as shopping center developers have had to evolve and adapt. The days of um, getting those giant national brands to sign 20-year 20, 20 leases is kind of over. Um, there are so many incredible emerging brands. So we have a variety of ways for any brand to enter the mall space um, from as small as merchandising one of our own carts. So everyone's Picture they're like the Dead Sea or the people kind of <laughs> shoving things in your face. We're trying to weed those out um, because that's not a good shopper experience. Um, but and and you'll see if they're more like this the um, kind of impulse buy um, I need now carts. But it's also a great place to start because there's a very low overhead. We own the infrastructure. You can get set up in a couple weeks and um, start testing out your product. I also really love um, the brands that are creating these little mobile tours. Um, for example, decking out like a VW bus with their merchandise and then just driving I don't know what a more mobile tour is. I'm very excited oh, about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. I come from the land of walking, which is New York City. So what oh, is this mobile goodness. tour? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's all the rage. Um, people are using food trucks to do it too. So picture that. Um, we hosted a Botkie activation, and what Botkie did was deck out a little VW bus. It was very on brand, merchandised, and they drove this thing from mall to mall, set up in the common area and like the highest traffic location for a weekend, talked to guests, sold merchandise, and then they moved on. And it was not only a really successful sales opportunity for them, obviously they sold a lot of merchandise, but they were also able to test which markets did people were really receptive, where did they make the most sales, and it was a way for them to see, okay, well, we did incredibly well at Santa Monica Place, so um, maybe we should explore setting up more permanently. And um, again, you would talk to somebody like me or one of the leasing representatives, talk through your goals and objecti objectives, and then we'll work you into the shopping center in the most relevant way. I love these creative marketing experiences that can actually test out sell through data. That's really, so, so in terms of like different case studies that you guys have seen with direct consumer brands or brands in general, or just going to brick and mortar, what have you seen been a very successful campaign? And you mentioned one, but are there a couple other ones that you could mention sure. so that we, we can all think outside the box as we're, you know, trying to figure out how to get, you know, more sales? <clears throat> Well, pre-pandemic, we were already seeing like the Warby Parkers of the world and Blue Nile opening up retail stores. Um, Post-pandemic, it's just kind of exponentially grown. So um, Allo, Allbirds, Peloton, um, even the uh, transition from old school car dealerships to opening up a, sh a pretty showroom and a shopping center that's an inviting and an environment for women to shop. Tesla is doing a really good job, and now everyone's knocking that off, actually. 
Um, we have a shopping center up in San Francisco called the Village at Puerto Madera, and it's a glorified EV shopping mall. It, we have Tesla, Polestar, Lucid, and um, just opened up a new Vietnamese EV brand called VinFast. So yeah, it's really transforming the landscape, and it's, again, making shopping more exciting and interesting every single day. I love that. I can all speak a bit about my experience because I was in exactly that spot. Um, didn't have a whole lot of capital, had a brand, was thinking about whether we wanted to go into brick and mortar. At the time, I felt very strongly that I wanted to own the customer experience end to end. I didn't want a third party in between. I wanted to know who my customer was. I wanted to make sure they had a perfect experience. And um, what we ended up doing was doing a trial, um, and we did a shop and shop inside a West Elm. And it ended up doing so much better than what we had done in the entire year, the prior year. And that, to me, was a sign that we actually needed to do this and get into brick and mortar, and I needed to just set aside my thoughts on owning the consumer end to end. Um, it's just a really great way for you to test. And as you're testing, you can actually have a conversation with these people in person and see what they like about your product, what they wish you had. Um, and it's also a great marketing tool. Marketing now is so much more expensive than it was five years ago, 10 years ago in the heyday of direct to consumer, right? So it is, even if it's not a sales channel, think about it as a marketing channel. What Aaron was saying earlier about DTC brands at open stores seeing higher sales in the areas, e-com sales in the areas where they have sales is so true. We saw the same exact thing as well. Um, and it was ultimately what convinced us to branch out into brick and mortar retail. And so if you're a brand, I mean, especially if you're a new brand and you want to do the in-store, where do you go? What do you do? I mean, how did you do it? I love the, I love the hustle that you had to be like, I'm going to do West Elm. That's, a, by the way, a major retailer, not a minor retailer. And I'm going to just do a shop and shop. I mean, how do you yeah, even, where do you, I mean, you. I know now you know Aaron, so you can really get, <laughs> please call and, 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 and you text and me now. you have an experiential area, you know, sp space to, to try to get your sell through data in person. But, but what, what's the way, what's the best path to getting into, you know, malls like yours or well, you know, know, even, even West Elm, or how did you do it? Uh, so West Elm, I don't know if they still have this, but they used to have a program called West Elm Local, where they would have local brands that are featured in their store. So I literally went to the store and said, hey, these are my products. Can I, leave? <laughs> Can I basically have a little shop there? Um, and they actually, they loved the concept. They loved our products. And they said, yes, absolutely. And then that grew into something bigger. And then we were in a few stores after that. Uh, so honestly, just people are really nice. They want to help you. Go talk to people in person, um, and hopefully they respond and they love your products and want to help you get your first start. We, I was also, I was, um, I had a team of buyers under me at Walmart, and one of the things that we, of course, we worked with the mega conglomerates, but we also loved working with smaller brands and giving them their first shot at having retail distribution. It was just such a special thing to meet people who are incredibly, incredibly passionate about what they were doing and giving them that first order and giving them distribution and have millions of people see their products on the shelf. So you're going to see a lot of that as well. And if you want to get into a shopping center, um, just go to that center website. At the bottom, there's usually a management office phone number. Um, or you can go to the shopping center developers website like maceridge.com and go to leasing and you can um, email or call the number there. And they will put you in touch with the correct person, your local person. You sit down with them, visit the shopping center and really just talk through your options because there's so many. It doesn't have to be, there's not, the barrier to entry that there once was is gone. It's very easy now. So I feel like we're still in the wild, wild rest of retail where we don't know. We are like, we're, we're like, okay, now online spend is way too high. So now everybody's margins. Now we need to go to brick and mortar. Now we need retailers. Where do you guys think long term this is going? Because you've, we've seen such a change, like a vast change in consumer behavior, even a, a change in like the younger generation. Like I used to hang out, ha hang out at malls. I, my consumer behavior did not change in my teens. But these guys are like, well, sometimes I buy on Instagram and now I'm hanging out at the mall. This, this last year I couldn't go out. Now I'm out. What, so where do you see long term, like in two to 
Peyton, let's take out like in the next three years, where does this go? And then what do you think in the next 10 years? Basically, malls have to become fully exciting experiences, like amusement parks. <laughs> Um, you have to be able to shop, you have to be able to have a drink, you have to be able to see a movie. Um, yeah, it, it has to be fun because that's the only thing that's going to differentiate us from e-commerce. All right. But I think brick and mortar retail is here to stay. It's just such a large share of retail sales. And like I said earlier, literally the worst thing that could have happened to it happened. They were forced to shut down all stores and yet here we are it's still the lion's share of retail sales i think human beings are social beings and i think there is nothing that can really replace that that human touch that people want um, i actually had a metaverse company reach out to me and they created a little avatar of me and they were doing a pitch and in that pitch i was a little avatar walking around a mall and I was like, what? <laughs> why am I still at a mall in the metaverse? Um, but, you know, I, I think it's just, and the, the whole point of it was you were meant to hang out with your friends that live in other spaces inside of a mall and, um, to, and to really create that human experiences of what men generally do with video games, which is, uh, <laughs> but I was, I was thinking about that and I was thinking about the fact that I would rather just have this experience in person and go shopping with my friends than do it sitting on my couch in the virtual environment. I hope no one from that company is here, by the way, but I'm sure, I'm sure it's a great idea for some people. But I, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think there's so much value in spending time with people and seeing things in person. Um, and if it does go away forever, I think it will be a very, very long time from now when all of us are dead. <laughs> As someone in the trade show industry, which is a live people business, I, I believe that we're all pack animals. We need to be human touch. We had a, we ran virtual for year for two years, and I can't tell you there's nothing like in person. There just isn't, and there's nothing like being able to touch, taste, smell whatever the the product that you have, um, and and be able to really also experience it in a beautiful way and make a memory. Right. The burger so. hanger is buzzing right now. I mean, you can hear it. Everyone's just loving talking to one another, and this is. You know, people will always crave human interaction. It's so awesome. Great job. It's so, so great. Um, and so then just parting advice on just where, in, in terms of just like where brands can really help scale, like what's the number, what, is, there like a, is there like any tips that you have for, okay, so I go to your website, I do the thing, I get this, but then just besides making experiential, what can you, what other things can people, like, is there some other tips that you would think of to kind of really help scale the sales. Become a Klarna merchant. <laughs> well, and also Klarna does do marketing, right? Can you just talk a little bit about what type of marketing? Because I do, I feel like we never talk about that, but it's actually like the secret sauce of why a lot of um, many brands use Klarna is because there is yeah. marketing when you, from, I mean, from a crazy amount of uh, yeah. resources. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, for those of you that have heard about Klarna, you're probably familiar with our Buy Now, Pay Later product. You go on to most websites, we're there. Um, we also have a marketing platform. We're actually one of the top 20 publishers in the country. Little known fact, um, we have a massive app that has millions and millions of consumers, has really high engagement. So what we do is we work with retailers to have ads on our platform, if you have a deal going on, different things like that, and we drive consumers back to your site. So that's a way that we drive traffic, but we also, of course, have a lot of other data on you, so we're able to segment consumers, send them um, marketing via our CRM channels. In the in-store world, which is uh, my world, we are also able to do geolocated push notifications and SMS that have been really successful. So if we know that a, a consumer is about 10, you know, 10 minutes away from Sephora and Sephora is having a sale, we send them a push notification saying, hey, Sephora is having a sale. It is incredibly, incredibly powerful to have that real-time marketing in place, and that's one of the things that we do really well. It's pretty awesome. And I don't know any other, you know, credit bank or credit card company that does that or has that data or will market for your brand. So, I mean, kudos to you guys. Yeah, I mean, no other banks are doing marketing, I'll tell you that. Yeah. 
<laughs> we love it. We love the tech. We love the innovation. We love the malls. We want to keep the malls healthy, happy, and well attended. Um, but thank you guys, really appreciate it. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you.